Good morning. It is so good to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you stand as we lift our praise and worship to our God, who is so great and so good. Let's praise him this morning together. the Lord together.
great and glorious God. Let's continue giving him praise together this morning.
only God, Holy Father. It is so good to be in your presence, to worship you, to declare your praises and your glory. To remind ourselves of your goodness and your faithfulness, your blessings and your freedom that you have so generously poured out on each one of us. God, while we can declare your goodness and your faithfulness, we also know that there are things in our lives that are hard and difficult and painful. But we also know in declaring your goodness and faithfulness that you are a good God and that you have good things in store for us according to your purposes. So God, this morning we praise you, we thank you, We delight together in glorifying your name. You pour your spirit out over, over us. Would we see you in this place? See how you are working and moving. And go out from here declaring your goodness and faithfulness. Declaring what we have seen and heard and already been a part of here this morning. Be with us as we continue to worship you. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and we pray all of this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Lord. We're doing this morning. Um, we are doing something called Summer Family Nights, and there is a flyer that's out on the table just outside of the sanctuary doors. Um, if you would like to take one or hand one to somebody that um, comes to your mind. But we're doing these Summer Family Nights on June 24 and 25. It's a Monday and Tuesday. And the idea is that the whole family comes and enjoys some fun music with dancing, and I know, dancing, and um, a fun Bible story. And then the children go off into their appropriate age groups. It's nursery through sixth grade, and they get to do fun things like crafts and games, and they have a connection and snack to be able to relate it to their life and to enjoy good food. And so they're, while the children are enjoying that, the parents remain here in the sanctuary, and we have some guest speakers who are coming in. On Monday the 24th, we have a guest speaker. Um, her name is Reverend Kelly Folks, and she is not only a children's pastor, but she's also a counselor, therapist, and she is going to be talking to parents about parenting and anxiety, whether it's anxiety that parents have or it's parenting a child with anxiety. And she's going to help to be able to, um, how do you deal with that? How do you work through that? Um, and all of the aspects of that. And then the next night, we have for the parents, we have a panel of guest speakers. We have Chief Kyle Box, who will be here speaking about um, basically the um, social and media interactions and how to be safe for your children and protect them in that. But we also have Reverend Jerry Walden, who will be speaking. And he is also not only a pastor, but a counselor. And he will help parents to know how do you create an environment for your kids to share with you if they have experienced something difficult throughout their day or somebody that they know is going through something difficult throughout their day. And then how do you then help the talk through that so that they can deal with that in healthy ways? So we are super excited about that. And not only did I want to share it with you, but I also want to ask church family, please pray. Please pray in the days leading up to this event for um, hearts to be open, to um, feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to come if it is something that is helpful for them or for loved ones, but also to pray for those volunteers and all of those details that get put in place leading up to that. And then please pray during. Please pray for all involved, whether volunteering, attending, speaking. Just please pray for the Holy Spirit to just bathe and just wrap around this whole thing because Families are in need. Families are truly needing help. Children are truly needing help um, in these days. So just please pray for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Sarah. We continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. There are boxes out in the back in the foyer and on the way out, offering boxes where you can give. Also, you can give online uh, as well. And in the seat back in front of you is a communication card. If you're a visitor, love to have you fill that out so we can get in contact with you and welcome you. 
and um, also it's a great way to let us know what's going on. And one of the things that I've been doing recently, uh, I had a group of small people, a group, not a group of small people, <laughs> but a small group of people, that's better, a small group of people who, uh, who came together and wanted to know, ask me if they could uh, get some sermon notes and questions, and I said, sure. And so every week now, I'm making some sermon notes, going over kind of a synopsis, and then don't, don't, if you would like those, if, you, if you'd like those, just take a communication card out right now and give your email address and say sermon notes, and I can send those to you. Uh, don't tell me on the way out, because I will forget it before I walk five steps away. So i uh, just love to have you do that. Uh, one of the uh, real privileges of being a part of the Global Church of the Nazarene is having missionaries to come and speak. We're going to have a missionary come in July, so you won't want to miss that. But a few years ago, we had Reverend Tim Eby, who was uh, come to Perry, and uh, he talked about what was going on in Senegal, Africa. And Senegal is in, in the Human Development, uh, human development uh, Index, which kind of rates... Uh, income and life expectancy and education. Senegal was like 170th out of 190th. So it was a very needy country. And um, so one of the needs that Tim, uh, Tim Eby shared, Reverend Eby shared, was that they need a clean water well to be drilled in an area of Senegal called Kolda. And this new family would help, this new well would help families. It would help families so they wouldn't have to travel very far. Uh, as, as sometimes school, uh, school aged children have to go all the way to travel to pick up well water, safe drinking water, so that they aren't able to go to school. And so uh, that well would be very helpful to the community and it would also revitalize the work of the Church of the Nazarene. A local pastor who would be assigned and he would be able to uh, be supported through the well and through being able to use that as an outreach opportunity for the church and the community. So the Lord put this on the heart of, uh, first of all, Rob and Sue Allman. I know they don't want to mention their name, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Uh, Rob and Sue Allman had put it on their heart. They shared it with some friends and eventually they shared it with the church. And in the year 2022, we've raised money for this well raised $11,500 for the well. And those were sent to the Senegal field in late 2022. And we're excited to report that there is a clean water well project that has been completed. It's been completed for some time now. We're just getting an opportunity to share that with you. Um, this new clean water well is an answer to prayer and a true blessing for the Colda Church and that community. And they are excited to see the revitalization of the work of the Church of the Nazarene in this area through the addition of that clean water well. And so that is so important. The global Church of the Nazarene serves the world in many areas through in a lot of different ways, through hospitals and schools and orphanages and compassionate ministry centers and, and so many different things. They have ministries to help victims of human trafficking and help those who, uh, orphans that uh, have been uh, orphaned by AIDS in Africa, AIDS epidemic in Africa. Uh, compassionate ministry projects include something like this new water well in Senegal, funding assistance in Myanmar, uh, caring for Ukrainian refugees in Poland. There are so many different ways. And yet at the very foundation of all of this is the local church. This is the strategy of the Church of the Nazarene. This is the strategy of Jesus. He entered the world, entered, entered into our communities and lived with us to bring the gospel. And so the purpose and statement of the Nazarene Missions Department reflects this strategy. The Church of the Nazarene Missions exist to pioneer, develop, and resource local, interdependent, and sustainable Nazarene churches. That is the ultimate goal, the purpose of the Nazarene Missions. And this is the strength, because local churches are the backbone of all else that we do. So that when we have a, a need... We, we have people there already on the ground in over 160 world areas who are there and able to connect with that and able to preach the gospel. And so it is the foundation of uh, our missions program is the local church. Uh, as is stated on their webpage, Nazarene Missions is funded through the generous, sacrificial giving of people and churches throughout the world. Even in Senegal, they are taking up offerings for missions. 
Uh, we are a unified global church supporting Nazarene missions throughout the world. We are living out the transformational love of Jesus Christ in our local communities worldwide through his message and our action. Church of Nazarene is over in over 160 world areas, and so the next time you see a crisis in the world, chances are there's Nazarenes there. And so I encourage you to continue to pray for missions, to learn about the Nazarene missions, and to give uh, to Nazarene missions. Uh, we do that often through our World Evangelism Fund. Many of you give weekly gifts of faith promise every week, and you can get in on that anytime you want. You can start giving regularly to that. But we believe that this is the strategy of the Lord to see the transformation of the world, and it's so important. So I uh, just encourage you to do that. All right, let's stand, greet one another this morning before we uh, hear the word. All right, good morning. Okay, you may be seated. We're going to look at Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3 this morning. By the way, happy birthday. Not Mike Dietz, who had a birthday yesterday. There he is, way up in the front. Is that because you've just had a birthday? Way up in the front row. He's, he's moved up. Congratulations, 80th birthday. I wish I could work like Mike at my age. I, I don't think I could work that way when I was 40, so uh, less, less, less. Yeah, I take a lot of those. Uh, so anyway, happy birthday, but I'm not talking to Mike, I'm talking to the church. Happy birthday, the church. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and that is the birthday of the church. Uh, let me explain that. 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, dead uh, it was Pentecost Sunday. And, and the timeline is this. He rose from the dead, and for 40 days after he rose from the dead, the resurrected Lord appeared to the disciples and the apostles, teaching them about the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit and preparing them for his departure. And then after 40 days, he ascended into heaven, and he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will come upon you and will fill you with power. And so on that great feast day, the day of Pentecost, when Jerusalem was filled with people from all over the world, all over the known world, where Jews from all over the world would come, and the city was packed with people, the Spirit of God descended on them, and it came like a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and flames appeared over their head. That uh, wind and fire, two very powerful forces in our world. The Holy Spirit came with great power, and it filled the believers and they have filled with great joy and great courage. And they, began, they took to the streets and began to testify that Jesus is alive and, and risen. And Peter preached a great message, Acts chapter 2, you can read that. And thousands believed in Jesus. And they began to meet together. Uh, every day they would meet together in the temple courts and in their homes. And they would share with each other not only what God was doing in their life, but they would share with each other whatever need people might have. They cared for the poor, and God began a great work. And that was the beginning of the church. And uh, that is who we are. And so this morning, we're going to look at this story, Acts chapter 3, that I think describes the church in so many ways. Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. One day Peter and John were going uh, up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him, them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. 
And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Peter looked straight at that crippled man. He looked straight at that beggar. Do we, as the church, have the boldness to tell the world to look at us? When we see a beggar at an intersection holding a cardboard sign, uh, telling him the, the story, as we wait for the light to change... Probably the last thing we want to do is make eye contact, right? Because if we do, they will come over and expect something from us. Maybe we don't have any cash to give them. Many times we don't, right? Maybe we don't think we can afford it. Probably, though, we're not so sure it's the right thing to do to give them money. Um, we might believe that they're just a scam artist. They're just trying to take advantage of us. Uh, we might think they might use the money to buy drugs or something. We might just believe that helping them will actually just enable them. Actually, helping them will hurt them, and they need to, need to not have that happen. There's a book written called Toxic Charity. There's another book I've read called When Hurting Helps. Both of those books talk about the challenge of giving and figuring out how to give well, how charity can actually hurt people. And, and, and the way that happens is we can undermine the dignity of a person. We can diminish their capacity when we begin to take responsibility for things that maybe we shouldn't take responsibility for. And it can create an unhealthy dependence, which is really bad person is dependent upon us. So throughout these books that I've read and, and looked at, there's a couple of points that they make uh, to give good guidance to us about when we give to someone in need. First, they say, never do for someone else what they can do for themselves. That is a great principle, right? Never do for themselves, uh, do for someone else what they can do for themselves. It undermines people's dignity to treat them as if they are powerless uh, we create an unhealthy dependence, as we said. We can feel good about ourselves, but, but it can lead people crippled, basically. Secondly, uh, they suggest that limit one-way giving to emergency situations. That is, that one-way giving in which there is no reciprocal relationship, where I'm the one giving everything, and this relationship is only a one-sided relationship. They suggest, these people who study this and who work in these fields, say that we should limit one-way giving to emergency situations. Thirdly, they say to strive to empower people. Don't reduce anyone's uh, confidence in, their, in themselves or their capacity. Instead, we want to do something to make people feel like they can accomplish more than what they are doing if we're going to help. And fourthly, they say, above all else, do no harm. So when I look at those books, I realize, boy, it is, it is hard to figure out what to do and how to respond to needs. It is difficult to know what to do, uh, how to give. The, the, the causes for poverty are extremely complex. Solutions are unclear. And there is a strong temptation, therefore, to do nothing. Which Christians, we just cannot do that. We cannot do nothing. I'm not saying that we have to help every person we see on the corner, but there is a great temptation to be overwhelmed by the amount of need that we simply close our eyes to the needs around other people because of the challenges that they cause. Instead, we should allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Because regardless of what wisdom to do as far as a certain situation, the Holy Spirit has a wisdom that is different. Holy Spirit has a wisdom that comes from God, a wisdom that can bring real help to people. 
And that wisdom is, uh, can come, as Paul talks so much about that, uh, that is, 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 is not through figuring things out and calculating, but it can be inspired by God to do something that may not always make great sense, but God calls you to do it. And the church ultimately is a church of people led by the Spirit to do things that the Spirit calls us to do. So before we write down these rules and say, okay, this is my hard and fast rule in which I, in which I respond to, we need to recognize that we need to lead the Spirit's leading, that we are partnering with the work of the Spirit, that there's nothing really we are doing on our own anyway. We don't want to do anything on our own. We want to let the Spirit lead us, and we want to allow the Spirit to work through us to bring real help to people, to help people to stand, to help them to walk, to help them to run, whatever that looks like, to help them in emergency situations and needs. So that's the first thing we want to think. There are challenges, but... We can't let those challenges completely paralyze us from the opportunity to, to respond. There are reasons not to make eye contact with beggars. <laughs> but Peter and John would have had those reasons too. I mean, first reason, they didn't have any money, right? Here is a beggar asking for money, and Peter and John don't have any money. Very easy for them to say, you know, we need to pass on by this guy because we have nothing. But they didn't do that, did they? Instead, we read that Peter looked straight at the man. Oh, he didn't, he didn't turn his eyes away. By the power of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, Peter looked, and John looked straight at the man. The word in the Greek is atenizo which is the word to stretch or to strain. We see Peter and John straining, focused attention on this man. I mean, that is not just a casual glance. That is when we really take time to see someone, to understand them, not from our perspective, but also through the perspective of, of, of God. Focus their full attention. And one of the things we as a church need to be is we need to be people who can focus our full attention on others, right? We are called to love God and love others. One of the ways we love people is by paying attention to them. We live in an attention deficit world. It is hard to give attention. It is nearly impossible for people to give attention because we are so distracted by everything around us, so distracted by this world. But that inability to stay pay attention to each other and really focus on each other is part of the reason that we are so lonely in America part of the reason we are so depressed in America there is such a hunger for relationships we are hungry for connection and and in this connected world so-called connected world you would think our hunger would be satisfied after all we can give texts to all kinds of people we can tweet um but the more we have been connected through social media and other ways, the less we have been really connected, and our hunger for connection is, seems to be growing, and the need is greater. It's only gotten worse. We exchange vast amounts of personal information with people, but we are truly not known because we live in pieces and fragments. That's the way the social media can be. We live in, in information we want to share, the edited version of ourself. And, we, and other people share their edited version of their self. The virtual image. And so that really doesn't create the kind of connection that we are intended to be because we are embodied creatures. We communicate so much more with our bodies than we do with our mouths. So we... We struggle in our world to sustain attention or focus. We just don't have the time, despite the fact that we have so many now time-saving devices everywhere. We do not have the time to have a face-to-face -face relationship with people, to pay attention. 
Peter gave his full attention to this crippled man. And he said to the man, look at us. This man didn't want a face-to-face encounter either. Uh, when the crippled man uh, saw Peter and John coming, we read, they, he asked them for money. He saw them, and yet Peter still said, look at us. So Peter recognized that even though the man saw him, he was not wanting that kind of interaction, that face-to-face interaction, not the kind of intention that Peter and John were given this man. The, The crippled man didn't want any of that either. He didn't want any of that. And so Peter says, look at us. You need to see us more than just an ATM machine where you enter the right code and then cha-ching, you get, you get the money. And, and how easy that would be to think of that. Here comes this guy, people walking, and if I just respond the right way, I'm going to get money, and that's what I'm after. And of course, sometimes money is the right thing to do and right thing to give. In the early church, there were all kinds of offerings taken, by the way. If you don't like church offerings, well, <laughs> that was starting long before we came around. And they would uh, take up these offerings, and, and, and we read in the early church, those early days in Acts, that people would sell their possessions so they could give it to the Apostles, so they could be distributed to people who had need. There was a lot of that going on. There was there was people, not only the wealthy. It's a mistake to think that it was only the wealthy who were giving during Acts. It wasn't. Even the, even the poor sacrificed and gave. Uh, even the widows who were cared for by the church had responsibilities to serve there's a whole list that uh, the new testament writes if you're gonna if you're gonna if we're gonna care for you as a widow because you've lost your income there's going to be some responsibility it is a two-way kind of relationship in the bible there is always this two-way kind of relationship because because there's a, a level of respect for people dignity and so even even the poor were giving in fact paul writes about the philippian church in, in Corinthians, he tells the Corinthians about the Philippians church. The, the Corinthians were having a little trouble uh, giving what they were committed to. So Paul says, well, let me remind you about some people who are worse off than you. Um, Paul said that through severe trial of intense poverty, this Philippian church gave a generous offering. Humbling. Are you kidding And in that letter, Paul writes, after he talks about that, 2 Corinthians 9, he says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If you want to reap, you better start sowing. If you're stingy, guess what? You're not going to sow much. You're not going to reap much. Um, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food... will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I mean, how many of us have found out, as the old saying goes, you cannot outgive God. (laughs) The more you give, the more he blesses. There is never a better investment than in the kingdom of God. The missions program of the Church of the Nazarene, as we talked about, we partner with Nazarenes in other parts of the world to help them seek the kingdom of God where they live. And they teach us all kinds of things as well. They are teaching, preaching, healing, and caring for the needs of people. We are a global church, which is so exciting to me. So when I hear unrest about unrest in in Haiti... I think of my friend Charles Demarzier, and I think about, he's not there right now, but I remember he grew up there. 
And I think about, I wonder what he's thinking. Sometimes I talk to him, see how he's doing. When, when I hear about the war in Gaza, I remember the time when Sandy and I were in Israel and we ate lunch with Palestinian Christians. And I wonder how their life is right now. I wonder what's going on with them as we ate lunch with them and tried to help them serve others. When you give a well, we, we can think of the people, the individuals there. Child sponsorship, you can see the person. We partner with people. We give and pray and see people that we never have seen before. It opens our mind, opens our heart. Our heart gets larger, and it's much more than being an ATM machine. But there is a temptation. It is easy for us to, to give money and to check it off our box. It is much harder for us to give ourselves of ourselves, to give our time, to give our attention. Peter would not be just a cash register. Peter said, look at us. Um, to be seen, to be truly known is a greater sacrifice than money, isn't it? That's a different level. I, people can give all kinds of money. But what about opening up their heart to people so that you can say to someone, look at us. Let's have a face-to-face -face encounter. It takes time. It takes courage. It takes the willingness to get our hands dirty which means risk. Not sure how it's going to turn out. It may be bigger than we ever thought. That's what Jesus did. Jesus walking through the crowd, was walking through the crowd one time and people were pressing up against him and a woman reached out and touched the hem of his garment and she had a disease that made her unclean. She was not supposed to be in that crowd. She would contaminate everyone in the crowd by being in them. And, and so she hid her hid herself away, reached up, touched the hem of his garment in order to be healed. She was healed. Heading away, escaping, and Jesus stops and says, Who touched me? And Jesus waited and waited until she couldn't hide anymore. And she came and fell trembling at his feet with fear. Truth opened up and said, Here's who I am. Here's why I did it. I was doing something that was wrong. I was putting everyone else in jeopardy just for myself. I was so consumed with what I was going through. She tells the whole story. Ready to face the judgment and condemnation of that whole crowd. She, I mean, that's not an easy thing for her to do. Who knows what they could have done to her in judgment and penalty for what she did. But Jesus demanded that she waited for her to, to bring that story out. And then to everyone in the crowd, he said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. She is no longer unclean. <laughs> as, as is said in Scripture, Dare not call something unclean that God has made clean. The whole crowd thought they would be contaminated by this woman, but the love of Jesus is more powerful than the shame and the uncleanness of this woman. Jesus touched lepers and they were cleansed. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, they were terrified. The resurrected Lord appeared to them. They thought he was dead. He appeared to them in the room. They were terrified. They thought they saw a ghost. And if not a ghost, then they were looking at the crucified body of Jesus, now healed. And Jesus said, touch me. He said, touch the very places where the nails went in. Touch this body that was beaten and spat upon. Touch this body that was crucified and buried. Touch this body that was, had been rotting and where rigor mortis had set in. Touch this body of death that has been cursed. Touch it. Because the power of the resurrection will overcome it. And you disciples are going to get half used to touching things that were once dead that come to life. 
Willie Jennings James says this about this moment. He says, this moment is more than proof. It is forgiveness. It is reconciliation and peace. The body of Jesus is not simply evidence. It's much more. Love bound in bodies can now continue through death. Praise the Lord. I love that. Love bound in bodies can now continue through death. Touch can be eternal. Jesus presents to his disciples a way through the fear of death by simply touching him. It will be the way of his disciples. Disciples must touch and be touched. Could it be that the church weakens its grasp on the resurrection precisely in its timidity to present itself to be touched by the world? Even at this moment, the church is yet plagued by fear of touch. Shaped in worship services where people sit or stand side by side, hermetically, hermetically sealed in their private piety. The call of the church. Be touched and to touch. Jesus showed his scarred and allowed himself to be touched. Can, can we as disciples of Jesus touch those things that would repulse most people? Can we not be so worried about contamination? Because after all, we have the Holy Spirit in us. That's why Jesus touched lepers and people were scared of touching them because they were going to get contaminated. And that's why the early church cared for those who had the plague, even when it caused them to die. It didn't matter because guess what? We're going to touch the things of death because the resurrection overcomes it. Are we too proud and too defensive to ever let our guard down to admit that we are sinners and that we have our own wounds? James says, confess your faults, your sins, one to another, that you may be healed. Just as Jesus showed his scars, we also have to show those areas of our life. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can be honest. We don't have to hide our wounds and when someone has the courage to share about their own wounds, about their own healing, then I have the courage that I can share about mine, that I can be healed too, that, that my sins, my wounds are not fatal either. If their wounds weren't fatal, mine aren't either, and I am not alone. And as Bonhoeffer says, if someone is alone in his sins, he is utterly alone. But we are not alone, because the resurrected Lord is with us. And he causes the church to go out and to touch the places that no one else would want to touch. Peter says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Peter said, look at us. That is a bold thing to say, but the only reason he says it, the only reason he could say it, and the only reason we should ever say it, because we don't want to be an uh, egocentric people, Right? Look at us, look at us. No, that's not why he can say that. The only reason Peter says this is because he had looked upon the face of Jesus. He had looked upon the resurrected Lord. And as we look upon the face of Jesus, our face is transformed progressively as we stare upon Jesus. And so it is not ourselves that we are giving. We are letting people see Christ as they look at us. Peter stared at the crippled man because he had been staring at Jesus. Peter could give his full attention to the crippled man because he had given his full attention to Jesus. And you say, how can he give his full attention to Jesus and how can he give his full attention to the crippled man? No, that, that is really the key of the spiritual life, isn't it? How can we live our life all throughout the day and still live in constant fellowship and direction of the Holy Spirit while we're busy doing everything else? How can, we, how can we give our full attention to the Lord and our full attention to the crippled man 
Because Jesus becomes the filter through which we see everything in life. And I dare not make a judgment on my own. That's a judgment based on human wisdom. I dare not look at the man on the corner of the intersection and immediately make a judgment of my own, despite the fact that I know all kinds of situations and can maybe make guesses about it. It's just guesses. I allow the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ to be the filter through which I see everything. And I don't want a judgment based on just human wisdom. I want a judgment based on the Spirit. Peter stared at the man said, look at us, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He helped him to his feet, and he started walking and running and jumping and praising God. Look at us so you can see what we've seen. The resurrected Lord. Often the unstated assumptions behind most of our dealing with people in need the unstated assumption is that we want to make them more like us. Here's our life, and we've got this, and oh, if you just did what I did, you would be like me. <laughs> That's not the church's message. Sometimes it is. It shouldn't be. Sometimes the church's message has been to export, export the American dream to the world because we have silver and gold in America. But we also have extreme, extreme form of individualism, a partisan divided country. We have loneliness and depression, and we have lost our sense of shared purpose. We are a disconnected people. We, we, we have so much wealth, we don't need people. We really don't. So we all golf off, off in our little world, and that is not who we're called to be. There, there's a better story that we have to share than the American story, and that is the resurrection story. We see the risen Lord, and we share with people, we allow people to look at us, even the wounds that we have, even the areas of weakness we have, because as Paul says, we are very bold because we take the veil off. We don't pretend. We don't hide. We are very bold. We just allow the Spirit to work through us. Keep our eyes on Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And we say, look at us, world. Because you're going to see Jesus. We want you to see Jesus. That's the point, not us. And when the world attacks the church like it does so often, throws stones at the church, we just do what Stephen did. Stephen was executed. They threw stones at him. And Stephen, while in the process, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw heaven open and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, I see the Son of Man at the right hand of God. And his face began to glow like the face of an angel while they were stoning him to death. And before he died, he said, let not this sin be held against them powerful testimony of God's grace forgiveness is possible forgiveness is at the very heart of the message of Christianity look at us because we have looked at the resurrected Lord when we failed miserably when we sinned against him and denied him he rose again and now we see him and forgiveness is there because of the resurrection Look at us, because we've seen the resurrected Lord. And he's your hope, no matter what has gone on in your life. So just a few points. First of all, can we, be, as Christians and the church, give our attention to the world? In this attention deficit world that we live in, can we be the people who have a surplus of attention? We can actually take time to slow down. And believe me, I preach this to me as much as you guys. <laughs> you get busy, you lose sight of people. How many times have I missed a moment because I was so caught up in myself? If anything, the Holy Spirit ought to be able to get me out of myself. And the only way that happens is by focusing on Christ. So we give our attention to the world. We stop making quick judgments. We listen to the world. We listen to stories. 
We've talked about this several weeks now. Do not judge. We think we're in a position to judge. We think we have all, all kind of wisdom to make that. We do not. We don't even remember what happens to us in our life very well. There's no way we're going to be able to make assessments of other people. So we stop judging. Allow the Spirit to give us discernment. Will we stop judging? And then we willingly enter into face-to-face relationship, two-way relationships with people when we get opportunities. We give when we can give. We certainly want to be, have opportunities to use the resources that God has us, but, but it is much more than just that. It's opportunities to be involved in that. We give self-sacrificial love like Christ gave for us, laying down our life for others. That's the most powerful force in the universe. The resurrection reveals that love is stronger than sin. Love is stronger than condemnation. Love is stronger than accusation. Love is stronger than the grave. It is stronger than guns. It is stronger than tanks. It is stronger than jets. It is stronger than all the militaries put together. It is stronger than laws. It is stronger than threats. It is stronger than vengeance. It is stronger than hatred. It is stronger than all the terrorists put together. This is the strongest force in the universe. It is utterly unconquerable, the love of Christ. It is undefeatable. It is unassailable. It is indestructible. That is the love of God. It is invincible. It is indistinguishable, inextinguishable, unshakable, unbreakable, unparalleled, unequaled. It can't be measured against anything. It is utterly insurpassable, the love of Christ. And so we trust in the power of Christ. (laughs) And when we do that, we offer our lives to other people and participate with what God is doing in the world. Let's bow our heads. Father, it's an amazing powerful message the resurrection of Christ because if anything seemed to stamp out love the love of God it would be that crucifixion and yet it didn't and you overcame that the violence the anger the hatred the worst that humankind could be. And yet you conquered that. Forgive us, Lord, when we have had so lack of faith in your power and your love that we think there are situations that are just too fatal and that there are wounds that cannot be healed. Forgive us, Lord, when we thought about that on ourselves, Lord, and we've come to define ourselves by our weaknesses and by our wounds but we are children of God that is who we are and what you have planned for us is not yet known but when we see you we will be like you forgive us Lord when we make judgments about other people forgive us Lord when we've been protective and hit ourselves in a sense of pride we can't let our guard down we can't be real honest We always have to put an image up. Forgive us when we do that, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we just get too busy with our stuff that we never have the time to do what you call us to do. It's so easy to let the inertia of life just take us down a road that we just, before long, we've lived our life and we don't even know what we've done. So, Lord, help us. Help us to to see you clearly and to allow you to penetrate our heart so that we can sacrificially give your love to others. Lord, would you purify and sanctify your church? with the Holy Spirit, with wind and fire. 
blowing into our lives and, and unsettling some things that need to be unsettled, knocking down some things that need to be knocked down and burning up the chaff, burning up the things in our life that need to be burned up. You know what they are, Lord. And uh, right now by your spirit, you're revealing stuff to me and maybe to others that need to be burned up. We lay it on your altar right now that you may be glorified and that we would be the people that you call us to be. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And now may the love of the Father and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless.